I'm interviewing Joel Sartori in my office at National Geographic headquarters in Washington, D.C. today. And Joel's just put out a new book called Rare, Portraits of America's Endangered Species. Joel, tell us a little bit about this book, why you have published it, and how you have organized it. Uh, the, the book basically got published because I'd done a magazine story for National Geographic on the Endangered Species Act. And um, while I was at it, I went ahead and shot long on the story. As we say, I shot another few months and tried to get as many different endangered plants and animals as I could uh, using uh, studio backgrounds and studio lights and uh, turn it into a book. So the, the point of the book is to get people to realize all that's at stake and uh, that they should care before this stuff all goes away. I mean, there's not much time for a lot of the little plants and animals we see in this book, so it's, it's urgent to me to get the word out. How have you organized the book? Uh, the book is organized into uh, sections. For example, if a species has more than 10,000, it's, it's in the front of the book. If it's fewer than 1,000 and down to nothing, it's towards the back of the book. So it's a kind of a countdown of sorts, um, down all the way to something that went extinct while we were making the book. Um, a little animal called the Columbia Basin Pygmy Rabbit. There were two old females when we started doing the book, and they both died in the production of the book during that time period, and so now the Columbia Basin Pygmy Rabbit is no more. And so we're still causing things to go extinct. People may not think about it much, but I do, and I just want them to realize that it's, it's very critical to not let the rest of the natural world slip away. I mean, it's it's folly in a way to think that we can drive everything else to extinction, but it won't matter to us. It won't have any effect on us. Well, I'm here to tell you it's level to bite us real hard if we lose enough, enough species. Now, you specialize in white or black backgrounds. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your photographic technique and what sure. equipment you use? You know, for years, I photographed animals in the wild only. And um, it, it's fine and it's, it's very appropriate and I still do that, but in this case, I wanted to photograph a lot of the smaller creatures, the snails and the clams and the, the beetles and the, just you know some of the small like rodents even that are endangered. And so I found that putting them on black and white backgrounds was, was a great equalizer. You can give as much weight and consideration to a beetle as you would a polar bear, for example. They're the same size relative to the printed page. You don't really have any si way to compare them or, si or to a size comparison. So you could give equal weight and consideration to all creatures, great and small, using this technique. So I was very drawn to it. And you found a lot of the animals in zoos. What were some of the challenges in photographing these animals? Yeah, you know, zoos are often the only place some of these animals are left. They are gone from the wild. M many of them are gone from the wild. And so if you want to see them, you better go to zoos. Zoos are arcs, basically, now. They're kind of, the, they're, the, they're the last place where these things exist. There are breeding programs in place for many of them. And, um, and it's critical that the zoos continue to get funding to do the work or we'll lose a lot of these species to extinction. A few, a few of these species, though, uh, can be only found in the wild. One of them is an endangered fly that took four and a half months to get a permit to, take, to capture one fly from the wild, anesthetize it with CO2 gas, it's out for about 15 seconds, then it wakes up unharmed on my black background, I get a few pictures, there's four federal agents there waiting, and we all watch it fly off unharmed. We put it right back on the plant we found it on. We watch it fly off unharmed. So that one we had to do in the wild because nobody keeps the federally endangered fly in captivity. And uh, I had to hire a federally licensed fly wrangler to catch the fly, and it was a big production, man. It took months. <laughs> That's terrific. How many years have you put into this book, these wonderful photos? Um, I probably put about four years into the book now. And... Um, uh, I still continue to photograph endangered species when I can. I had to, uh, I think the last species I photographed for the book was the California condor. And um, that was kind of, that was one I'd really wanted to see because that animal got down to fewer than 30 birds at one time in the 1980s. And now it's made a comeback. It's at over 300 now. So that's when we didn't know whether it would make it. It was nip and tuck for a long time and it did make it. So we're really, I'm really thrilled about it and especially thrilled that I got to see one up close. You know, the condor, here it is, right here. The condor is living proof that when we want to save something, we can. I mean, if you think about it, if you look at the bald eagle, the bald eagle is something that was in terrible shape, and we eliminated DT, DDT from the environment, and we saved it. There's a whole chapter in the back of the book devoted to the species that we've saved. 
The red wolf is another one. The black-footed ferret is another one. The whooping crane is another one. A section called On the Rise. The American alligator is one that was in terrible shape, and we regulated hunting, and now there's over a million of them. So, you know, it, the thing is, we can do this if we want to. But first, we have to know that these things are, are even in existence. And as we turn our attentions more and more to TV and the Internet and what's, you know, what the price of the pump is, people tend to forget that we're all connected to the natural world, and it's very important to, to treat the other species we share the planet with, with respect. Now, we're about to celebrate or mark the 40th Earth Day. Do you have any message to viewers and your followers as to what they can think about? Uh, you know, the number one thing to me is to watch how you spend your money. That's huge. I mean, people think you have to wait for an election year to make your voice heard. Not true. Every time you break out your purse or your wallet, you're saying to a retailer, I approve of what this is made from. I approve of the distance it took to get it to me in terms of the fossil fuel used to transport it. And I want you to do it again and again. So, I mean, this has huge implications in how we live and, and in how we, how we leave a footprint on the earth. We can reduce our footprint or the impact we have on the earth just by spending our money wisely. For example, if you have a lawn, don't buy chemicals to put on your lawn. Those chemicals end up right in the watershed eventually. A, a big rain washes them all off. Even if they've soaked down into the soil, that eventually will get into the water stream. So you're pouring chemicals down the drain. Try not to water your lawn. Don't, don't run a sprinkler system if you have it. Because when you water your lawn, your grass grows. And when your grass grows, you have to mow it. And when you have to mow it, you burn fossil fuel. And who likes to spend time behind a mower anyway? They're loud and they're stinky. So let's see, what else can they do? If you go and look for furniture at a furniture store, find furniture that's not made out of tropical hardwoods. Don't cut down the rainforest to make a dining room table. It's things like that. It's in the car you buy. It's in whether or not you walk or, or drive to work or to the store. I mean, I see people driving Hummers to get to the gym. That makes no sense to me, you know? I see people eating strawberries in the dead of winter when they shouldn't be. You have to truck a strawberry or a tomato across country from Florida or California so that you can eat strawberries in the wintertime. Eat them in the summer and buy them locally. It's better for you nutritionally. Odds are you can get them organically grown so they're not full of chemicals. And it's better for your local economy. It helps support local farming. That's going to be really, really key as we go forward as the price of fuel continues to go up is to buy things produced locally. That's a very big deal. So every time you break out your purse or your wallet, you are voting, and that's tremendous power you have in your hands. All good advice. Now, where can people see your photos apart from buying your book? Um, they can go to rarethebook.com. That's www.rarethebook.com. They can see the book there. They can see other behind-the-scenes stories and videos and that kind of thing. They can go to where any bookstore, any, any bookstore can get it for them, or they can go to nationalgeographicbooks.com. However they get it, it's fine. Just get it. Thank you for all the good work you do, Joel. Thanks so much.